flight as the scientific advisor to the German Parliament. Uh, Professor Andreas is the editor of the Risk and Conflict Local Responses to Natural Disasters, authored with the Rajiv Shaw, uh, published by Emerald Gilly in 2013. And his talk will be focusing in terms of his work in the region, uh, mostly focusing in Fiji and also in Cambodia, if I'm correct. So the format of the, the talk today is uh, he will actually make a presentation for the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes. And after that, we can have a Q&A session and open discussion if you have any questions. So please, uh, let's give a warm welcome to all the members around the table. Conceptual frame. 
framework uh, very briefly. We have uh, still some external pressures, uh, climate related natural hazards, but also um, development um, uh, pressures like hydropower development upstream in both um, research areas. Um, there's extractive industries, logging mostly upstream areas, mining in downstream areas of those cash firms. And uh, in the center, we have uh, livelihood security, which we believe is made up of food security, water security, and energy security. You might have heard about the water energy nexus, if that's something you guys work with in, in your um, daily activities. Just briefly, the nexus um, has been um, developed since 2011, um, started with the World Economic Forum, quite strangely um, kind of brought up by private sector as um, a major challenge for the 21st century. How do we avoid geo geopolitical conflicts that might arise from not having enough water, not having enough food, and facing also an energy crisis. Um, it was popularized in uh, uh, Bonn in 2011 at the Nexus conference, the Water Energy and Food Security Nexus. Uh, what we look at in our project, um, we develop this kind of framework. Uh, we look at environmental livelihood security, and uh, we see this as the challenge of maintaining global food security um, and universal access to fresh water and energy, um, and at the same time sustaining key environmental uh, systems functionality. Um, so we have the um, water food energy nexus here, uh, embedded in, in, in the environment, we have human demand, demands um, and natural supplies, we have livelihood pressures and certain environmental pressures, and then we have here the livelihood framework. Um, I think most of you will be familiar with the sustainable livelihood framework. So we try to combine the full issues with the sustainable livelihood um, framework uh, simply. But the second um, important part of the Framework is this outer um, area where we look at five different dimensions of um, uh, climate change adaptation. Um, we build on uh, the framework <coughs> which was developed by Akraval and Perrin in um, 2008, I think, where we look at diversification, mobility, community pooling, storage, and uh, market exchange as the four major dimensions of, of adaptation and coping. So, um, in more detail, if you break down those, those dimensions, um, you can have um, individual, you can um, tease out individual um, coping and adaptation strategies. If you look at mobility, you could um, move entire homes, of course, you can move fields and livestock, and we will see examples of that um, in the presentation. Uh, there's labor mobility where people look for work outside. Um, particularly in Cambodia, but also in Fiji, people have um, increasingly uh, multi-local livelihoods where some family members uh, live elsewhere, um, there's remittances from these family members to the family, or where one particular member of the family has multiple livelihoods um, across uh, different spaces. In storage, we have water, food, firewood as um, important items to, to store um, during and after a disaster or before the disaster strike. Uh, household items, savings um, as, as major uh, storage um, strategies, then there's communal pooling, people might um, pool resources, they might pool infrastructure and labor, and they share all the information and knowledge among each other as another strategy. Then we have typically diversification as a strategy can be agricultural diversification, fishery diversification, assets and skills can be diversified, and consumption choices can also be diversified. Um, often, um, you might know that in a uh, flood disaster, uh, people shift their diets from, for example, uh, root crops to uh, tree crops because trees uh, survive the flood and then they can harvest uh, uh, the tree. And we have finally market exchange, um, where um, can develop a strategy of selling alternative 
produce, they can uh, exchange in terms of product or buying insurance, which is coming a hot topic. Uh, I think here also in Southeast Asia, um, but it hasn't been implemented too much because um, of the cost that it imposes um, for uh, farmers. I should say that most of our work. <clears throat> so here's a glance of the Bar River catchment in Fiji. Uh, who has been to the South Pacific? One person, so you <laughs> want to <laughs> um, a very familiar place for, for most of you. Um, Fiji Island is made up of, of uh, a few hundred islands. Uh, in Fiji Lingu is a major, major island with the capital Suba here. And our uh, study area is here in the north. Western part along the Bar River catchment. The interesting thing is that um, the communities that we look at are actually very close to proximity to each, with each other. Um, and um, basically, we have one main village here, Hotua, and then uh, because Hotua became too crowded, people spread to, to other communities and build up uh, new settlements. Uh, but they are all very close to each other. Kilometers apart, and um, the only village that is a bit further in the inland is Navada, the uh, picture that you saw on the first slide uh, in, the, in the hillside in the interior of the uh, bar catchment. <coughs> now, if you uh, go to the um, Bar River Delta here, you will find uh, much bread fishing or catching as the, as the main livelihood income strategy. Very pricey mud crabs, they are sold for $70. Dollars per kilogram, so it's, it's really um, <clears throat> a luxury item, particularly in Australia. And um, there's sugar cane, which is mostly done by uh, Fiji of Indian origin, which were brought to Fiji um, during colonial times to um, work on uh, sugar plantations. And um, then there's mostly subsistence agriculture, so most of the indigenous Fijians. Don't grow any cash crops, but mostly grow root crops for um, their daily subsistence. A very self sufficient um, type of, of life uh, in those communities. <clears throat> and um, this is a plant of uh, Karachi province in Cambodia on the western banks of the Mekong River. This is our study area here. And you see here, people are very well already adapted to floods. They just construct their houses on, on um, those stills, pillars, um, and they are continuously um, elevating their, their houses. Whenever they construct a new house, probably it's 50 centimeters to one meter higher than, than the, the previous one, uh, because floods have not necessarily increased in frequency, but they have increased in intensity. So when, if a flood happens, when it happens, it's usually a very, very large flood. Um, and often more prolonged than before as well. <clears throat> the, the communities are pretty much isolated. There's uh, just a road along the, the river here, but there's no way to, to come up, uh, come to the area from the west. So people usually cross uh, the Mekong River by ferry. And most of the crops are corn, tobacco, um, rice as well. Tobacco and, and corn mostly. So the, the type of work we did um, in terms of the methodology differed a little bit between the two study areas, mostly because in Fiji it's very unpopular to go there with a the questionnaire. People find it very offensive to come with, um, with a 20-page uh, questionnaire and, and ask questions about their um, adaptation strategies or their perceptions of, of climate change. What is uh, much more acceptable is sitting around the cover bowl to drink basically <coughs> um, uh, a drink made from uh, a pepper root. Not very delicious, doesn't make you addict um, <laughs> at all. <coughs> and this can go on for hours, so you might end up drinking 20 um, half coconut shells of um, this drink. It makes 
your makes your tongue numb. Um, after a while, you don't feel your tongue anymore. Like you can still speak, but in a rather relaxed way. So actually, it's kind of um, has mildly anesthetic um, um, effect, um, and, and it's an antidepressant as well. Um, and yeah, so that's where you basically get the information from the elders who sit around the cover board and to chat. Kananoa, which is our main strategy there, is it's actually literally translated as idle chat, like talking about nothing, but actually you talk and you get the information that you want. But you need to also give a lot of information about yourself. So when I talk about disasters, for example, I mentioned that I nearly drowned three times in my life, and then people have a bit of a connection, okay, this guy also has a bit of an idea what it means to be um, to be in a flood situation, or in my case, it was post in the post diving, <laughs> um, or swimming in the, in the Atlantic. So, uh, we also did uh, semi structured interviews, so we visited uh, several households, talked to individuals. That was three and a half years after the 2012 flood. I had visited the area in 2012 directly after the flood, and this is now follow up uh, research. And what we also found uh, through strategies, we distributed journals to all the households and we asked them to write about their individual experiences after the um, disaster struck. So we asked them, tell us what do you think, why did the disaster happen, how did it impact you as an individual, as a family, as a village, and what do you prepare, uh, how do you prepare for the next uh, disaster. In, uh, both in, in Cambodia and in Fiji, <coughs> the, sorry. both in Cambodia and in Fiji, we also did participatory hazard mapping. Probably mostly familiar with, with you guys. Yeah. <coughs> when you work in, in communities, you probably do this on, on a regular basis as well. What we, what we do participatory mapping for is not so much having a map <clears throat> as an end result, but rather engaging local people in a conversation about spatial aspects of uh, disasters, how um, they diversify their life even spatially. Um, so it's, it's less about having a fixed output and saying, well, this is a disaster affected area, this is the area that should should avoid. We don't want to teach the villagers, but we want to basically engage them in conversations where they themselves maybe detect uh, things that they can change in their in their adaptation strategies, but not imposed by us or suggested by us as, as researchers. <clears throat> so the, those are the issues that we raised during the participatory mapping exercises. Um, these two pictures are from Cambodia. Here is participatory mapping in PG. Um, and then we try to, to kind of uh, get a sense of what people do um, in terms of adaptation. Uh, what are their coping mechanisms? What are alternative livelihood approaches? <coughs> um, in Cambodia, we also tried uh, a, a different method, and uh, it turned out to be quite useful when as well. Um, we did 13 Q-sort sessions with um, different groups of uh, villagers. Who is familiar with Q-sort? Not a, not a uh, concept that, is, uh, that you're familiar with. Um, what you do basically is you, you um, present the, the focus groups with a set of statements, and you ask them to put those statements on this kind of grid, which is an upside-down pyramid. And um, they can put one of the statements in each of the slots on this grid um, according to the degree with which they agree or disagree. And the difference um, between QSOL and the Likert scale is that you force people to make very strong statements because they have only one statement that they can absolutely agree with and only one uh, statement that they can absolutely or very strongly disagree with. So you force them to make their statements um, more explicit, more, more extreme also. 
<clears throat> so it's this um, probably you can't see all that in, in the back, but um, we have a, a status for um, <coughs> climate and disaster perception. <coughs> so, uh, for example, flood down more frequent nowadays than in the past. Floods do not cause major disruptions to people's livelihoods. During floods, more people in the village get sick than usual. So, this is the kind of set uh, of statements that we present them with when it comes to perception. And um, as in the second round, we asked them about coping and adaptation. Um, so, we had um, questions or statements like, in the case of flooding, we move our farm animals and other valuables to higher ground. We do not need to change our sowing and harvesting times to cope with flooding. During floods, there are more fish to catch, which compensates for the crop damage. Um, so we have these, these different statements, and then we ask them to um, put them on these four. So they were written um, on, the, on one side in, in Khmer, the other side in English, so that foreigners could understand what uh, was being discussed. And um, the statements are presented on cards that people can change the, the position of the cards, they can discuss and move things around before they uh, eventually decide on the final result. Yes? How did you come up with the statements? Um, that's a good question. Um, we had a first exploratory phase where we did these semi-structured interviews. And during these um, these same structured interviews, we got a sense of what are issues that we can put in the statement. What kind of statements make sense, uh, and what kind of statements we can discard because it's actually not a not really an issue in this part of the area. Yeah. Um, we want to now adapt this also to PG, and we, we already have a good sense um, for PG, like for our community, also. What Is it a closed statement or the local can also edit the, some statements? No, they are closed statements. That's why you, you, <coughs> you basically need this kind of um, pre survey where you already get a good sense of what are the issues in the community and what kind of hazards mm -hmm. do they face. Um, for example, there's not much point to ask about uh, storms in, in Cambodia because they are not facing a lot of Storm, storm events, but droughts and floods are particularly important in those um, communities. <coughs> While in Fiji, we will focus more on cyclone events and floods and droughts, which is sort of three major events. So, uh, how big is your focus group in terms of how do you actually select them? Um, the participants range from three to maybe ten maximum. Ten used, um, turned out to be a bit too many. Too much, and, and there were also people that were totally passive and didn't involve. <coughs> so I think the good number is five to six. Yes. Were you able to get some indigenous knowledge also in the formulation of those statements? <coughs> Again, the <coughs> sorry. Again, the, the statements basically came out from the pre-survey. So the, the local knowledge got into that. For example, in the interviews, people talked a lot about how they catch fish directly from the house because the flood was around the house. They couldn't um, go to the river, but the river basically came to the house. So they said, uh, during the flood, we can catch fish. So one of the statements was, during the flood, there are more fish, fish to catch, so you can uh, basically compensate your crop losses. But this turned out to be, most people disagreed with that statement because um, they said if there is no flood, you can go to the river, there's more fish. So we just kind of can have a bit of a, a livelihood um, supply to the flood, but it's not better than without a flood. Yeah. But um, what we found also in, in our first survey was that most people actually were quite happy with the regular flood. They said <laughs> the flood cleans out the area, all the rats are gone, mm -hmm. um, all the pests are gone, there's uh, more fertile soil, um, and we can cope very well with the flooding, and we'll come to that in a minute. Any other questions? Yes. Um, 
any other question regarding the project? Yes, in terms of yeah, participation, did you manage to have like inclusive participation, like uh, gender, visible? Yes, uh, yes. We, we made sure that um, men and women were equally represented. Oh. So we had a uh, youth group, even in one case, a uh, group of uh, young children, because their mothers so turned out to be um, uh, uh, illiterate, so they couldn't read statements. And mm -hmm. even when the, um, the Khmer research, the Cambodian research assistant, uh, translated those statements, it was like blurry for them. So uh, they said, why don't you ask our, our kids? They go to school, they are well educated, and then we brought the kids in. Also, ethically, that was a little bit of um, something we shouldn't probably um, have done because of our ethics policy, which is very strict in this year. Normally, you cannot work with children under, under 16 um, unless you have a bit of consent from the child. Yeah. Sorry, just uh, interrupted yeah. uh, about the program. So, uh, do, you, do you include the person with this? Because when we work in the community, sometimes we also uh, find some difficulty to involve disability person in to our activities. We didn't deliberately ask for people with disabilities to join groups, but there were, um, I, I remember at least two groups where two or three older elderly people with disabilities were participating. Mm -hmm. um, but we raised the issue in this one of the statements actually. <clears throat> Side, I think it would have been good to have maybe a special group yeah, uh, with yeah. uh, people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. I might pick that up for our teaching, teaching kids. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yeah. Maybe, maybe after. So, so in the end, it looks a bit like, like this. Yeah, so uh, people have to decide which statement uh, is relatively, they have a relatively neutral stance about and which uh, statement is the most agreeable one and which statements are the most disagreeable one. The problem, again, methodologically is a little bit uh, challenging because you need some kind of negative statements okay. where you know people will disagree, but disagreeing with a negative statement, statement makes it positive statement, so it's, it's a little bit difficult um, with uh, people that have no formal education to think that uh, a double negation makes a statement basically positive. So yeah. That was even challenging for our research assistants sometimes, but after a lot of training we got there. So again, um, you might not be able to see that in, in, in the back, but um, just to, to show you how we then analyze the data, um, we have a, a, a set of consensus statements where uh, different groups, or nearly all the groups basically had, a, had an agreement. Um, and and uh, that was, in the case of flooding, we use our farm animals and other valuables to higher ground. Most people have um, either individual plots uh, in, the, in the hillside, um, further away from the river, or there are communal areas where people can keep their uh, animals and valuables um, during a, a flood, which can extend up to two months, so you can imagine. But if because this, if your whole community is flooded, it's two or three meters underwater, um, how, how you kind of um, develop a strategy to, to cope with that. Um, here's the, the statement that I mentioned during class there are more fish to catch, which compensates for the crop damage. Uh, those are all negative, so um, they, uh, they disagreed with this statement. Um, but all, all groups agreed that they saw food, water, fuel wood. That was the most important um, preparation for the flood, apart from uh, moving animals, which are very, very important for local people uh, to higher ground. So, um, coming back to our five dimensions of, of adaptation strategies, strategies, we found that short-term mobility, moving animals to higher ground, 
and storage was, was um, the most important for all the groups that we worked with. <coughs> Basically, um, for this short-term mobility, when, when the animals are moved to higher ground, uh, what they do with locally is basically all the men take the animals to a safe place and all the women stay uh, in the village, bring the kids still to school with the boat, um, take care of the house that nobody steals anything, and um, after two months basically they are uh, re reunited. Um, so they are kind of living lives totally apart. Um, and um, sometimes the women take the boat and bring food supplies to their to their husbands and to other um, male members of the family. Now the the interesting thing is we, we went there with the idea that floods are disastrous and are considered problematic for those people. But as I said before, most people actually welcome floods as long as they are predictable, and and that's often the problem that. Nowadays, floods are less predictable in terms of when they happen. Um, sometimes they happen in, they used to happen in July, August, September, um, and now you can have a flood in October or November. And that's, uh, that are the issues, those are the issues where they um, cannot deal anymore because um, they, they face uh, these particular issues at a, at a time when they are not prepared for them. Uh, they, they also uh, mentioned. Chinese dam uh, construction upstream that affects them because they don't actually know when the uh, flash floods happen due to opening of the of the sluice gates of the dams. Um, but unanimously, they said the problem that we have is now droughts, and droughts are something we can't cope with. We can always cope with floods; um, we can adjust very well. But droughts is something we don't know how to. Ourselves, um, <clears throat> and there, that's where the government should help us. But governments are easy to help in terms of in, in times of floods, uh, because bringing food supplies to villages that are two, three meters underwater, it looks good in the media. It's kind of um, uh, makes makes good pictures. But an extended drought of four to five months can be much more disastrous. But the government actually has no way of Drought uh, because it's also less visible um, and, and it affects people in a, in a more slow, unsafe way than uh, floods. So, uh, apart from these consensus statements, we, we have distinguishing statements where we can then separate out different groups and how they cope with uh, certain issues. So, for example, um, one of the distinguishing <coughs> statements was that. Um, what, what QSOL does when you, when you do the analysis is actually a steady quantitative principle component analysis type of thing. Um, you have uh, factors that where different groups can load differently to, the, to those factors. So we have, for example, statements, many villages had to move away permanently because of frequent disasters, and one group agreed with that statement, while others disagreed. And uh, the same group also loaded positively on villages do not support each other very much to floods and droughts. So we could see like certain groups and this idea of we don't help each other, we don't have a good social network, and it's it makes sense also in combination with this statement, people just move away because there's no help locally. Um, there's not, not a good um, social cohesion between the villages. While another group um, that loaded positively on the factor two here um, is during the flood we grow crops in other locations where no flooding occurs. So they are kind of good in short-term mobility. They know how to adjust. Um, following disasters, many villagers seek work outside the village to cope with the losses. So people just go elsewhere to, for work. So those are the kind of um, much more adaptable um, groups that, that we need to do as compared to the more fatalistic stance of so that, that's the kind of interesting thing that you can tease out uh, through the two sort of statements to, to um, kind of um, get a sense of uh, different groups. And again, I come back to what you mentioned, 
about uh, people with disabilities. Um, this would have been an really interesting place to have fun with um, compost of, of people with disabilities. Interestingly, too, so, um, going back to our, our other methodology of participatory mapping, so basically what we did was we um, used these transparent plastic sheets on, on um, aerial uh, images, uh, satellite images, and then um, asked people to draw on, on those plastic sheets, and then we digitized the whole thing. And what was interesting for us was um, how um, much weight was, was put on man-made uh, man uh, reasons for um, droughts and, and floods most people mentioned deforestation as a major uh, factor in having higher temperatures as well, um, and the decreased flood frequency and uh, decreased rainfall. So whether that was really an observation or whether it was something that they saw in television or heard in, in the radio was not so clear, but they mostly felt it's not just a natural phenomenon, higher or lower rainfall or um, prolonged um, uh, uh, periods of, of no rain, but rather uh, deforestation as a main factor. Increased temperature was, was mostly mentioned as, a, as an issue that they are facing currently. Um, it's just getting hotter and hotter. People have um, um, uh, suffered from, from heat stress. The land is getting less fertile. Um, upland streams are drying out. The wind is more variable and gusty, uh, reduced agricultural seasons, more storms, uh, livelihood, uh, livestock is um, dying, and um, fruit trees are not fruiting anymore. So uh, that was really an issue that people mentioned as, as very pressing and depressing as well because they, they don't know how to actually adjust to that. Apart from some uh, villagers have now started to grow sorghum and millet. Uh, which is a very drought-resistant uh, crop, uh, which you usually would have in Africa, but not necessarily in, in northeastern Cambodia traditionally. What we also found interesting is the kind of socioeconomic differentiation through disaster adaptation. Um, we, we can see that better off households can uh, build higher homes. You see, um, if you look closely, you see that this household recently expanded the, the uh, pillars here um, by another meter. Um, this lady here shows the extent of the flood, flood in 2013. So you can imagine if your village is underwater um, for such a, um, at, at such height and for a, a period of six to, uh, to eight weeks, uh, that can really affect uh, livelihoods tremendously. And this poorer household here would certainly, at least people would have bad feet if not, um, the house would, would uh, be flushed away. Um, but we also found that better off households can buy land elsewhere, they can buy land in the hillside, and um, this goes along with more deforestation and that might also compound um, the disaster for solar uh, areas. Better off households can, buy, can build land um, on, on higher ground as a refuge area for livestock. This um, area here costs around 5,000 US dollars to build. So it's a, it's a huge investment for people. And they have this um, shed here for livestock and they have just uh, amassed a, a lot of uh, soil here to just build a, a higher ground for, for livestock. So this is all kind of contributing to, a, to a socio-economic differentiation. Um, wealthier households get wealthier, while poorer households get poorer during the, the disaster or in the aftermath of disaster. Now if you have a communal refuge area in, in this, in breakfast of a commune, there was communal land that was set aside for uh, people to keep um, the animals for, for six to eight weeks. Um, so this area here can, can take up to 800 people during, during the flood. And um, this is, of course, then 
open for everybody in the community of cool and information also. So a message to the US people who maybe have particular programs focus a bit less on individual household strategies but more on communal um, support because it's less differentiating um, between rich and poor. Okay, we come to Fiji and um, what happened after the flood in 2012 was that um, many people started to, to build two-story houses, which was a, which is a complete innovation in Fiji in rural areas. People always built um, their houses on the ground, um, but because the flood was so disastrous and intense, it was actually a double event. Uh, the first flood, flood struck in January 2012, which was still people were kind of laughing about it and happy and, and kids were swimming around. But then uh, a second flood happened in March, and that was not funny anymore. It happened at night, people were really afraid. Um, people got traumatized. I saw one um, person that lost the speech, completely couldn't, was completely paralyzed, couldn't speak anymore, um, just because of the trauma experienced by the flood. Um, but people still try to do the best out of it. There were lots of logs coming down from, from upstream. Um, and they used those logs, um, mostly pine trees, to, to build those two-story houses. Um, often it was the, still the better of people that could build uh, two-story houses, not so much the, um, the uh, poorer ones. Now this was in November 2012, and I visited the community six months after the, the second flood. And you can imagine if, if you stay in such a two-story building, for about flood lasted for about five to eight days, you can be there quite comfortably. Now, what happens if you have to go through a five-category hurricane cyclone, super cyclone, for instance? That was after the cyclone, um, so you can imagine uh, how how this village was affected. So they they perfectly adapted. To a flood, they were not prepared for a cyclone of category five. Um, and um, the, the house was destroyed. And this um, this was in November 2012. And four years later, May 2016, the person who tried to build this house in the story was just had to start again. You can imagine how frustrated people are, how, how this affects. Their resilience. I, I have never seen actually more resilient people than Fijians. They are amazing. Um, but if it happens more frequently in, in, in ever shorter um, intervals, you can imagine how depressed people start um, to become. Uh, and, and basically, the, the, the only adaptation strategy regarding housing is now just don't buy furniture anymore. People say, what's the point? Either we, they are they are under water, our our uh, cupboards and, and, and chairs and, and beds, or they fly away in the in the sky. So basically, they invest less and less. So this whole dream of building back better, mm -hmm. in this case, is is really challenged. Another issue that um, is quite interesting for um, this community, Utua. Is, uh, this was the school during during flooding in 2012, um, and this was not the same school, but a uh, close by school in the same community uh, in May 2016. So, what serves as a disaster evacuation center? There were like 200 people living in the school for for many days, I think two weeks in total. Um, what what serves well as an evacuation center in one case? can not provide much shelter in, in another case where the cycle is um, Those are the figures for PG 240 out of 901 uh, schools were damaged and 60 were completely destroyed by cyclone damage. So again, um, the challenge is increasingly to, to adapt to multiple disasters and what you, in one case you might adapt well Disaster, but it might be maladaptation in another case. 
Um, another example for adaptation to flood situations is um, planting more tree crops. People said after the flood, we, we knew that the, the only thing we could, we could eat was breadfruit, banana, papaya, uh, coconut, because those trees survived the flood. All our root crops, taro, uh, cassava, yam, that was all gone. Um, but we could still eat breadfruit, which is very high in, in uh, carbohydrates. But what happened in the, in the cyclone, trees were destroyed by Cyclone Winston, and um, those trees were flying around in the community and destroyed their homes. So um, now the sentiment is that it cut back all the, all the trees around the community because it's too dangerous. So again, you see the, uh, the challenges of a multi risk environment. It was also interesting, the government um, dredged the Bar River because they felt that if they dredged the river, there would be less flood uh, in the future. And um, which the, the geologists and <coughs> uh, natural scientists in our group actually um, are opposed to dredging. They don't think it will help much. It will actually um, increase the speed of the water, so uh, then flash floods might even be more likely with uh, the dredging. Um, but it was also interesting how the two communities in, in the mouth of the river saw the dumping of the dredge mud. In one case, in Botua, they said uh, because of the dredge mud, all our mangroves died and we can't find uh, crabs anymore. And in Amakarua, they were very opportunistic and they grew new crops on those uh, dredged areas where the dredge mud was put. So they found it was actually quite but a good measure for them locally. One community that we looked at was uh, Itatoko, um, and it was particularly interesting because it's one of the first communities in Fiji that has been uh, resettled. This is the old location where uh, basically the whole riverbank collapsed during the flood. 17 houses were just falling into the, into the river. Um, so this community was destroyed. It was also a satellite community of Otua, not Fiji here. Um, so that was the old location. And the government then, with Australian aid, brought them a few kilometers um, inland on the hillside, which is extremely infertile, it's exposed to the sun, it's exposed to wind. Um, it's shadeless, so uh, people actually, to a certain extent, complain a lot, uh, but they appreciate that uh, the houses were built with external aid. Um, the, these houses cost 30,000 Fiji dollars each, which is around 15,000 US dollars. No one in the community could afford this quality of house. Um, they said everybody is welcome to join them in this new community. There are 17 houses there. But they won't get the same support, they won't get any money from, from the government or from Australian aid because it was confined to these, those 17 families that lost um, their livelihoods completely. So these houses, this, with, with good uh, cyclone Winston, um, they, they were all um, fine. What flew away what were the, um, the government didn't provide, or Australian aid didn't provide any uh, kitchens, so they had to built like makeshift kitchens and, and bathrooms outside and those were all blo blown away by the cyclone. Um, but the houses that were built by external aid were all um, fine and standing. So people say we are safe here, but our livelihoods are at the river and it's far away now. We have to go walk for one hour. We can't bring boats there. Uh, we have to rent boats from Otua. So, and most of the people now live on welfare, so it's not really a, a great um, livelihood um, that they're having. Um, but because people were so traumatized uh, by the flood, they felt they had no alternative than to accept this, this relocation. And the Fiji government wants to relocate now more than 100 communities all over Fiji um, due to these searches. Uh, flood uh, uh, being flood affected and, and unsafe. The problem
problem is wherever you go in Fiji, you, there is no 100% safety at all. Um, you can't be secured uh, in the Pacific Islands anymore. Uh, then we asked um, in our semi structure interviews in Motua, we asked uh, is relocation really a, a strategy that you consider? And uh, about 80, 28 households, two were planning for relocation, um, and around nine. Nine households were considering relocation, but they were restricted. And uh, they said if uh, we had land, um, if we had jobs elsewhere, uh, we would go. But actually, it's a decision of our our elders. Um, they want us to stay because this is our land. We don't want to, uh, this is the land of our our ancestors. We, we have to stay here. Um, some mentioned again. Nine households mentioned relocation, but they. They themselves didn't like the idea because of cultural ties to the land, because of the history, because they said our lives are here at the river. Um, and AIDS didn't even mention relocation as a strategy. So, um, one quote here from an interview I personally think the headman should have considered relocating, but the ancestors have grown up here. The main, reason, the main source of livelihood is the river, so it's hard to, to relocate. So, this is the issue that people in the Pacific Island. Um, do we stay um, having our main source of livelihood still close to the ocean, close to the river, um, or do we relocate at, at the expense of being severed from, from um, our land? Uh, Fijians have a very strong sense, it's called Vanua, it's um, basically an understanding that land, people, and sea. So this brings us to, to issues around um, not be just being mobile in geographical space, but um, we, we need to think about mobility also in relation to social, to cultural space. Um, so it's not just about physical safety, but it's also about how people feel culturally safe in a certain, in a certain environment. So quickly, the last case of um, Navala, the other community that I showed in the first slide, it's a, it's a postcard perfect um, village. It's, it, as I said, it's the only village in, in Fiji that has com um, nearly completely uh, traditional agriculture, this um, so called Ure. And um, this was immediately after the disaster I visited there in May 2016. In the last year, and um, took I can. So, in, in this community, the, the traditional architecture 
most of the of those structures were still standing after the, uh, the disaster. But there is a group in the village that actually wants to get rid of these traditional houses. And they, uh, in the interviews, they said, "Well, after Cyclone Winston, all these traditional houses were destroyed." Which was not true because when you walked around, most of the of the houses were standing. There were around 20 that were partially or uh, completely damaged. But those were the ones that had not been maintained well um, because of lack of material. People were probably a little bit too lazy to go far away to, um, to collect the material to, um, to renew the houses or to maintain the houses. Now, these, these traditional Borek have a life cycle of around <laughs> five years, and then you have to renew them, not this, the structure as such with the, with the trees and so on. <coughs> So, uh, and, and if you build uh, a wooden house with, with a corrugated iron, iron roof, it will last for, it will last for, this is Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> 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 Okay. Um, so if you, if you build a, a wooden house with corrugated iron roof, it will last for 30 years if no disaster happens. And they, most people would say that's a better option, we live comfortably, um, and we just hope there's no cyclone in there. And, and in the interior of, of, of Fiji, people still feel they're relatively safe from cyclone. Cyclones. But as Cyclone Winston struck exactly in this, in this interior part as well, um, people are now debating a lot. Should we keep our traditional um, architecture, which also brings a lot of tourists into the community? It's, it's probably the most visited part of uh, Fiji. Uh, there are uh, groups every day. So some people might, annoy, might be annoyed that there's um, all these visitors. Others welcome the additional money that they bring because it's the only village in Fiji where you need to uh, um, pay an entrance fee. You're not going into the village, you have to go to the village headman and uh, give him uh, 25 Fijian dollars, um, which is quite a bit of money. And it all goes into a communal pool of funds so they can send the kids to, to high school or even to university. Um, so it's a uh, <laughs> so yeah, people people are now um, debating about whether it makes sense to, to keep the traditional architecture or go to, to modern houses. Um, the interesting thing is that the the land owner, all the all the land in Fiji is allocated to so-called matangales, which are clans, and um, the the head of the clan that owns all the land where the settlement is located, um, he is opposed to the traditional style of, of housing. So he wants to be have, perfect. He wants mm -hmm. to have, uh, thank you very much. Um, he wants to have modern houses. So this is one, one bure that was completely destroyed. And this is what happens for a relatively well-maintained bure. Um, if there's a cyclone, it just leans uh, a little bit to the side and it takes just a few days to re-establish the structure. And maybe um, kind of uh, 
a, a little bit of material just to, to um, restore it again. Um, and um, this this was an interesting quote. Um, this person lived in this house, and he also has a traditional bore just next door. And um, the the roof was taken off by the cyclone, and was flying around. You can imagine uh, if you get in the, in the way of such a horrible iron roof, uh, you can just be sliced in, in half. Um, so uh, he he himself said when the cyclone started, we all went into the bore because we knew it's safe. Um, and we vacated this this, um, uh, this house here. Interestingly, in all the communities we saw these tents that were brought by external aid agencies, mm -hmm. Chinese, Australian, um, they actually didn't use the tents um, for living. They just found it kind of fancy. There are the tent in the background and you can store a lot of items happy. Um, but it didn't really matter to them as a, as a real uh, disaster. Recovery um, tool. The government wants to keep the, the community still traditional. Um, they are opposed to um, moving towards the uh, modern housing um, because of the tourist aspect, but also because of the cultural um, interests of, of the government. Um, so here you see the Matangali. This is the, the village settlement. There are different Matangalis that own the land in the area, but only one Matangali owns the land where the village is, uh, where the houses are located. And uh, this uh, head of the Matangali, Tabu Rao, uh, he is opposed to, to traditional architecture. He wants to be modern. Although it's quite old, so it's kind of um, was a bit unexpected for us. Um, people say that uh, tourism is it's actually good to, to maintain our traditions to a certain extent, but they also don't want any foreign influence. If you remember the first photo that I showed you at the opening slide, we were all wearing Zulus, long top skirts as men. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter wear once uh, trousers, and immediately the little chapman came to see me and said, no way, uh, she will have a bad influence on, on other girls in the community. So you can't let your daughter run around with trousers. Um, she also has to wear a very long, long skirt. So they are very um, concerned about um, losing that tradition and having uh, negative influence. They are now having, um, since a few weeks, they have electricity in the community, so they will have TV and there will be even more influences from outside that they actually want to um, avoid. All right, so just some concluding remarks. Um, it's very difficult from our perspective, and I, I think from some of the examples that I show, to classify disaster response and climate adaptation per se as appropriate, successful, or maladaptive. Because um, what can be maladaptive in one case might be a well adaptive strategy for another case. Um, one, and, and uh, you, you saw how in, in the map how close those communities are and um, how different the issues are from one community to, to the other. They are they are multi-risk environments and there are apparently trade-offs between adaptation strategies. So first well or flood might be the wrong adaptation for a cyclone or for a drought. Um, there are diverse value-based assessments of risk. Um, there's this idea of cultural security tradition that keeps you secure, a sense of place that um, you feel secure versus this more physical security um, and risk of space that people um, might be afraid of. And um, adaptation by some efforts may increase risk for others. If people go to island areas to open up new fields, it might be a good diversification strategy for them, but the impact might be done. And um, I think also important is to, to remember that adaptation does not always mean that um, the action is taken voluntarily. So that people are embedded in, in cultural social systems where it's very hard to make individual decisions. And to say the community decides unanimously is also a, a kind of myth because. 
because they have always different interests in the community. And um, those are very difficult sometimes to, um, to bring together and um, to, to find a good compromise. And um, finally, I think we need to understand resilience and adaptation uh, relative to a very localized cultural context. Or even communities that just live a few hundred meters apart from each other might face different um, challenges and social cultural um, but different social cultural context, which is which was for me also quite surprising to, to see. Okay, a few people to thank because it's a yeah it's a collaborative program. It's not just me it's one of the people that I involved in um, this kind of research. And that's a lot of funding institutions, the new networks of global change research needs to be mentioned here. And you see how people still keep a smile and uh, mm -hmm. um, kind of showing their strength in the adversity of the disaster. If you want to follow the project, you need to update the website a little bit, but uh, you can check it out. And Thank you very much and you still have time for two questions.